Hi and welcome. Early Calypso in Barbados. The history of Calypso in Barbados begins around the end of World War II. Um, of course, Barbadian music goes back much further, and it's called banjo music. You know, in the 1800s and 1700s, banjo had already formed in Barbados. Music was being played uh, in various ways, which I'll give you a little background on. Um, but by 1800s, a time of revolution and lots of instability in the Caribbean, the same time when Trinidad was seized by the British from the Spanish, Barbados had already been for over 160 years an established English colony, a very prosperous colony, with a population of nearly 100,000, compared to Trinidad, which had maybe 10, 15,000 people. So Bajans already had their own music, distinctive dialects, and, and different ways of, of uh, celebrating music and so on. We did not have carnival, of course, in Barbados, but it had its own unique culture. The first known song sung in English by enslaved African Barbadians was documented by a man called William Dixon, who was the secretary to the governor at the time. And it's called Massa By Me. Massa By Me is a work song. And um, here's a picture of the manuscript that was written down in hand by Dr. Dixon eventually when he returned to England. And this document sits in the Gloucester Archive in England. Sugar production completely dominated the island's economy. And the enslaved people danced and sang when they had the opportunity um, on Sundays and, of course, on holidays, special holidays, especially Christmas and Easter, and, of course, at popover time. Here's a scene from the, the plantation to give you an idea of the type of activities that were going on. You can see the shack shack and the drum being drummed and people dancing. There may be a triangle in the crowd, but you can see this type of music was already part of the culture of Barbados. After emancipation in the 1830s, and here's a, a scene of a crowd of people coming down the main street or one of the streets of Bridgetown celebrating the emancipation. After this time, the large masses of, of uh, working people who were now freed, they formed self-help organizations to survive these what were really desperate times. And um, these organizations had structures that were based on the British Navy because the person who started this, these, this model of organization, he spent m many years in serving in the British Navy. And likewise, the music had a lot of the similar influences of the military presence in Barbados, the use of the snare drum and the big bass drum played with the mallet, the big triangle, the penny whistle, this type of music which you'll find also in St. Kitts and you, you find types of it in Guyana and of course in the southern states. It's a very big part of their folk music tradition, this military style of playing. Of course in Barbados it had a very distinctive sound because of the combination of the African rhythms that were being used to create the music with these instruments. Um, so these bands were called Tuk bands, or Rooka Tuk music they were playing. Tuk band, here's an example of the Tuk band from an earlier time. The type of music they would sing and play would be influenced by the church music of the day and very much also that military style of playing because it was very effective outdoors in drawing people and getting people excited and dancing. To summarize, this period of banjo music, banjo meaning any type of music that had a beat, <laughs> that had that African sensibility, it was looked frowned upon. It was a pejorative term at the time. 
So it could be drumming, it could be guitar playing or banjo playing, which where the word comes from, of course, banjo. Um, so at this time, there was also an addition to the drumming and singing and the different types of dances that were popular in Barbados. You would have had a tradition of minstrel playing, people walking around with a single instrument, usually a guitar or some makeshift kind of banjo or stringed instrument, and singing and making up their own songs. So all of this was called banjo music. Uh, we know some of the names of these minstrels um, that survived into the 20th century. Lindy Bradshaw, uh, Seymour Schillingford Airdard, better known as Schilling, uh, who was born around 1904. Um, Dove or Lord Dove, who was kind of a pretend preacher that would hang out by the bus stand and uh, move around Bridgetown and the South Coast uh, singing his songs. And he was a very uh, good at making up songs and doing the type of extempo stuff that you find in Calypso. Um, Iron Barr, the hungry man from Hillaby. And a, num a number of other characters who would, you know, walk around and, and play their music. In particular, there was Sam. Sam, the guitar man, I call him, because he inspired me to play the guitar. Watching him perform at the, uh, on Saturdays at the races, the, gar the horse races at the Garrison Savannah. Some minstrels were very accomplished musicians, and some could even read music well, like Schilling and Lindy. Mostly they played banjo, some calypsos, their own versions of pop songs of the day, and the original songs that they wrote. They did emigrated in great numbers to Trinidad, and to Guyana, and to other islands, to places like Cuba, Panama, Brazil. Uh, you would find Bajans all over the Caribbean. Many of them embraced the carnival and contributed greatly to the development of Calypso. They, along with other English-speaking islanders, have been reported to be mainly responsible for the Patois-speaking Trinidad becoming an English-speaking country by the end of the 1800s. So the British take over around 1800, and what they find is a Creole Patois-speaking society, a French Creole society that had formed in the last 25 years as the result of the cedula that was issued by the King of Spain in fighting other Catholics to come settle Trinidad. It was their last ditch effort to try to hold on to the small islands that, you know, they were losing all of these possessions to the British, so the British were becoming more assertive and, and wielding their, their immense naval power. The Barbadian influence in Trinidadian culture is quite strong during the 19th century. Of course, in the 20th century, it's the other way around. Trinidad is influenced with us. So there are many examples of banjo music, songs and melodies, ideas being taken by Calypsonians in Trinidad as the Calypso music starts to become a very, very popular idiom you know, the carnival and the calypso tent start to develop around the turn of the century, and Barbadians again are influencing this development. So the banjo music that they would have used would be songs, and here's an example of a couple of songs. The first example is Rum and Co Coca Cola, which of course is the big hit for the Andrew Sisters. It's credited to Lord Invader and the music to Lionel Belasco. Um, Invader had written and performed a song during the war, and the song was taken back by one of the American entertainers who had been visiting, and took it back to the United States and made it a big hit with the Andrew sisters. Rum and Coca-Cola. Here is the, the melody of the verse. Now, don't think of the words at this moment, just think of the melody. And you get something like this. When the Yankees first went to Trinidad, some of the young girls were more than mine. They see the Yankees treat them nice, and they give them a better price. 
So where did this melody come from? The melody comes originally, it comes from an old banjo song or folk song from the 1890s, the early 1890s called King Ja Ja. And the, the verse to King Ja Ja, if you want to live in sin, get a little house and put me in it. And if you want to play the fool, I get a big stick and I keep you cool and so on. So you can hear the melody be taken, the words change, and you have now a calypso, a famous calypso that became world famous. The other example I'd like to show you is a song by Bill Rogers. Bill was a very popular uh, entertainer and singer of calypso and also creator of the music of Diana called Shanto. But he had a big hit in Trinidad in 1935. He won a competition with this. So it's one of the early Calypso winning songs in Trinidad called the Weed Song. And the Weed Song for its verse used this melody. One day I met an old woman and I wanted something to eat. I was gonna put a little bit in she way but I get fat when I meet. I thought she had bananas, orange or pear, but was nothing that I need. When I asked the woman what she was selling, she said she was selling weed. So here is the song from the 1890s again in Barbados called Da Coco Tea. So this is almost 50 years earlier. This song is being sung as Da Coco Tea. I was once engaged to a lady, her love was all for me. No matter the distance we did live, it was no worry to me. But another gal, she did find me and take me away from she. And the only thing that could bring me back is a cup of da coco tea, da coco tea. Is a poison to me. So you get the idea how melodies are moving around. And this was a common thing in early Calypso, taking folk songs, taking little bits of songs from here and there, from the popular tradition from Grenada, Guyana, St. Vincent, St. Lucia. You see it all the way around in the repertoire of early Calypsonians. So there are no recordings of early 20th century banjo. The earliest known song that I have is by one of the minstrels, Schillen, who I mentioned earlier. And here he is singing a song called March Monkey. March Monkey is about a very hated policeman. Here's March Monkey. March Monkey was sharp, you know. He used to run the harpers to and fro. The shops he report for five minutes flat and the budget he won gets rent at the market gate. March monkey. So Calypso is starting to become heard in Barbados through the, the radio. They, of course, it's a traveling back and forth between, between the islands and people bringing back songs. So Calypso is being heard and being sung in Barbados now by these local minstrels and maybe a few other singers who knew these songs. Um, and uh, by the end of World War I, a Calypso community sprung up in Harlem, in New York. And Barbadians also participated in this development throughout the 20s and the 30s. The Bajans continued to immigrate to find better opportunities abroad. Lionel Belasco, a very famous band leader, he was actually born in Barbados, but he lived in Venezuela, Trinidad. He settled in, in New York, and he was one of the earliest recording artists of Calypso, and he's even attributed as being the person who influenced the growth of Calypso or the popularity of Calypso in the United States in that time. And by the 1930s, Grady Fusion which is a, a wired service to, to bring music into the homes, is brought to Barbados. 
and this radio fusion of course had a big impact on people's taste and people's ability to hear music from beyond their shores. They didn't play a lot of calypso. In their eyes, this was common class music and not worthy of being played on, on, on the radio fusion. It had to be classical or church music, or it could be popular American music, but of course, very limited selection. So it was not a respectable type of music, banjo or calypso. After uh, calypso was being heard in Barbados, also on Radio Trinidad and later on on Radio Guardian. By the mid 50s now, we get into the era of when Calypso started to be performed in Barbados in a more serious way. And we see an important development in music and the distribution of music. And that was the release of high quality Calypso compilation albums, LPs, by the Cook label. Um, this is around 1954, 55, and it was featuring Sparrow, Melody and Crystal and other singers and it was this that had all of a sudden people were hearing very high quality renditions of Calypso in Barbados and that changed many people's perception of what Calypso was all about in Barbados. Meanwhile the post-war emergence of steel pan had caught on very quickly in Barbados. Here's a picture of an early steel pan um, I think this is the Juicy playing at the port in Barbados. And here's another of the Coca-Cola steel band performing at a, a, a promotional giveaway uh, product event for Coca-Cola in Barbados when it's being launched in Barbados in the early 50s. According to Al Jilt, one of the island's top journalists, by the late 50s, steel band music was the order of the day. You had steel bands around every corner. <laughs> However, it did not involve the violence and the level of violence like in Trinidad. It was competitiveness among the bands which were mostly located in St. Michael. One of the, the famous Barbadians who made an incredible contribution to the development of the steel band as an orchestra as we know it is a man called Joseph Nathaniel Griffith. And Griffith was an outstanding band leader. He was brought to Trinidad to lead Tasco to the big festival in Britain in the early 50s. Griffith worked with the top steel band players in Tasco and invented a whole, sol the whole array of bass drums using multiple drums and the cello pans and so on. So he could get all the notes to arrange the music the way he wanted to. And you will also recall the steel band pioneer, Bajan Cecil, they called him. He was Cecil Ward of Sun Valley or uh, steel band and he worked closely with Sonny Williams. In the 50s, there were, that was the era of talent shows, these variety shows where singers would sing all types of music, but several of them sang Calypso. And um, these events took place at several cinemas, in particular, the Globe and the Empire Cinema. There were other shows at the Plaza and the Royal Cinema was a very popular one. That was in, in the Worthing area on the south coast. It became later on in the 60s the Vista Cinema and currently it has become uh, a department store. Local entertainers found work in the few local hotels that were operating, the Paradise Beach, Miramar, and remember this is the 1950s. Um, the Royal Hotel, the Caribbean, the Windsor, and the Marine Hotel. The clubs with live entertainment were the Club Morgan, that was the big one, Coconut Creek, run by an Englishman called Jack Teller, the Zanzibar, run by Darnley Greenwich. It was an after-hours club. Uh, Darnley went on to run the most famous 
nightclub in Barbados probably ever, uh, the Caribbean Pepper Pot. And um, it's the Blue Room in Bridgetown on Mar Hill Street. The Coconut Grove, these were two run by a Calypsonian called Lord, Lord Sippers. John's Bar, which was in Payne's Bay, run by a gay, a gay man. The Barrel of Rum on Broad Street. And there was also East Tree House, the Cloud Nine, which later became the Bearded Fig Tree. And an assortment of small bars and rum shops where singers would hang out. Plus, you had local dances at community centers, and then on special occasions, hi-fis would be brought in and set up at Queen's Park or in the steel shed, and there would be these big entertainment events. Uh, most of the, singer, the singers of the day were performing the popular songs, but occasionally they sang Trinidad Calypso. The first real Calypsonians in Barbados, I would have to say, were, were the Mighty Charmer and the Mighty Jerry. Charmer is Leopold Curtin. He was born in 1924 and passed away in, in 2014. Here's a, a song by Charmer called The Big Shot Laugh. <laughs> it's a very popular humorous song, a calypso in the late 50s. <laughs> People of different class. By the way, how them the clap. You could tell people of different class. By the way, how them the clap. You may meet up a person and invite them to a function. They'll have you so uneasy, especially if it is a social party. The big shot laugh, ha ha ha. The middle class laugh, hee hee hee. But when you hear the ordinary class, this is the way how them the laugh. What? Here is the mighty Jerry performing his song called Shamrock Ham. It's a song about a woman stealing ham from a local supermarket. One morning it was a rocket down in Shamrock supermarket. Wednesday morning big rocket down in Shamrock supermarket. A country girl from less than three. All of you should have been there to see she. She was bearing a big and can, and that's where she stole with the Shamrock ham. So a ball in. And um, Jerry had a fantastic style of guitar playing. He could whistle like an absolute bird, and he also sang beautifully. Here is Jerry. <laughs> Well, me mommy don't drink no whiskey, makes her too frisky. Oh, me mommy don't drink no whiskey, makes her too frisky. Oh, mommy don't drink no whiskey, cause it makes her too damn frisky. All she drink is candy brandy all the time. So entertainers in the late 50s sang at the hotels, they sang at the clubs, and you had others like the Lord Sivers that I mentioned, um, Desmond Burke, who's more of a folk singer. A uh, banjo singer in the true sense. Mike Wilkinson, who was a very powerful singer and eventually emigrated to the United States. Uh, he was mostly a pop singer and ballad singer, but he also sang Calypso. And we had even a very young Gabby coming on in the early 60s by then. Others were like Lord Radio and the Bimsher Boys, one of the most successful musicians and band leaders in the tourist industry in Barbados, playing around hotels. And they're featured on several early recordings as well. We had Froggy, Phyllis Collimore, and a few others. It would be remiss of me not to mention at this point a son of a Barbadian woman who left Barbados and went to New York. She was married to a, a, an American man from Virginia and their son left an indelible stamp on the popular music of the United States and the world. His name was Irvin Burgey. Irvin Burgey wrote 
eight of the 11 songs on Harry Belafonte's iconic 1956 album titled Calypso, the very first album LP again to sell over a million copies. So Calypso has the distinction of being the first genre to sell over a million copies in the mid 50s and earlier on in at the end in 1946 being a genre to sell the most 45s over a million copies which was uh, Ella Fitzgerald singing a version of Murder in the Market. I, th I think her title was Stone Cold Dead in the Market. In the late 50s, the JCs, a black middle class social service organization, one of the, the national organizations that was starting to replace the many, many um, smaller landship organizations of the working class. And they started a carnival uh, inspired by the Trinidad model. And the first um, Calypso competitions, sort of large scale Calypso competitions, and it was won by Mike Wilkinson. And here is Mike singing his winning song from that time, A Coming Up. <laughs> This is Barbados, and you bound to make a fuss. A great day in February, every man in the island should be merry. And if you sing in your college song, and you jump in two and four, it's a big celebration for the young generation, and the old ones can join the band. Oh, lad, a coming up, a coming up, a coming up, yes, to play carnival. In 1961, Little Baron won, and producer whose real name was Morris Ashby, won in 1962 with a song called King Dial. In 1963, the title was won by Don Marshall, Sir Don as they called him. And Don, who recently died in 2018, he won with two songs, one called Tax Dodgers and 20th Century Husbands. Here is Sir Don's. Husbands of today, shortening their life, having affairs with women, neglecting their wife. The husbands of today, destroying their life, having affairs with women, neglecting their wife. Personally, I ain't care what affairs they have in, but some refuse to give their wife any part of the loving. Spending 23 hours out of 24 with a woman who only want with the offer. They won't stifle in a day. They won't poison in a way. And he became one of the dominant figures in Barbados in Calypso throughout the 60s and the 70s, having his final performance in 1981, Sir Don. He also won the Monarch in 1965 and 1975. In 1964, The Mighty Charmer, he won in 1964 with a tribute to Kennedy and a tribute to Dr. Eric Williams. Other Calypsonians and other singers of this era were Sugar, the mighty big boy, Desmond Burke, who I mentioned, a young singer called Richard Stout, who went on to become a very popular local entertainer. And of course, you had the mighty dragon and you had the mighty Romeo. Charles Smith was his real name. Here is Romeo singing a song called Brother Fuzzy, a song about a priest who is bringing a, a mass band to the carnival. Brother Fuzzy bringing a band to compete in the coming celebration. Fuzzy and the shepherd get away, so he planned to play Master Doom and Day. I was so surprised when they tell me, he practicing hard and song in real sweet glee. Lord, they say how Fuzzy created such a beat, they feel it's meeting, we go rule the street. All right, hey, whoop a dee, whoop a dee, whoop a dee, la la la, and praise ja. Look, you tell them sister in.
Placing third in, in 1961 was a young singer who they call Manfis Bishop. And um, his real name was Dalton Bishop. He took on the stage name Jackie Opal. And Jackie was a consummate showman, great singer, great dancer. And when he got his big break, it was in, when Sparrow came to perform in Barbados in 1962. He was invited by Sparrow after seeing him perform to accompany Sparrow to Jamaica on the tour that they were on. He ended up staying in Jamaica for a while and he became one of the founding members of the legendary Scatlight. He influenced Peter Tosh and Bob Marley. Bunny Whaler said Jackie was one of the greatest singers he had ever heard. Tragically, he died young at 32 years old in a car accident in Barbados. In the late 60s, Jackie also created a new style of Barbadian music, a new beat, and he called it Spooge, but that's another story. After Sir Don won the crown in 1965 with Granny's Proverbs and Dear Mary Bray, the carnival was halted. It was becoming a little rambunctious on the streets and there was a lot of complaints from the, the very conservative Barbadians and the churches. And for whatever reason, the JCs were also maybe not well equipped to handle such an event. And this brought the carnival to an end, unfortunately. In 1968, Gabby won a competition held at the YMCA. Now, these were individual promoters putting on Calypso shows now, picking up the, the baton, so to speak. And um, people like Mark Williams and the Al Jilts, who I mentioned earlier, and some other promoters were holding local Calypso shows. So you had this competition that was held at the YMCA and Gabby won with this hilarious song called Heart Transplant. And in, again in 1969, he won with Family Planning at the Globe Cinema. In 1970, 71 and 72, there were no competitions. The era of big of bands was starting to unfold, was really picking up steam. So this was a time when there was all types of bands in Barbados playing throughout the hotel, hotel circuit because the tourism industry was thriving. You could find live music and live bands playing at every club, every small bar, and certainly at the big club venues and the big hotel venues. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And next time we'll look at Calypso from the 70s and 80s to give you a, a better idea of how the music evolved and what it contributed to Calypso internationally and changing the sound of Calypso worldwide. Thank you.